In the early days of the internet, radical libertarians were scattered, lonely, and faceless. Without direction, they resigned to scour the web, sifting through content providers in a wasteland plagued by YouTube demonetization, Facebook jail, and covert internet censorship. But then, in 2017, the Libertarian Union was formed. Finally, the average Joe Libertarian could find a thriving community of independent podcasters and content providers, all in one convenient location. At Libertarian Union, we'll always have the latest news, interviews, discussions, and even movie reviews. With hundreds of episodes and more added all the time, you'll always find something fresh at libertarianunion.com. All right, all right, all right. Uh, let's get fired up here. Maximum freedom. Read. Stay on target. Maximum. Stay on target. Maximum. Read Rothbard. <laughs> well, hello and welcome to the actual Anarchy Podcast, a podcast where we talk about movies from a Rothbardian anarcho capitalist perspective. And tonight, in this first week of November, we're going to do a Guy Fawkes related movie for the 5th of November. Remember, remember the 5th of November, something, something, the treason and plot. This is episode 101 of the show. You can find the show notes and more at actualanarchy.com slash 101. We do have a special guest that we will be introducing as soon as we get into the last nighters portion of the show, which will be coming at you presently. Uh, but before that, say hello to Robert real quickly, and then we'll get into the last nighters stuff. Hey, Daniel, how are you doing, buddy? How's everybody else doing? We're good. I'm good. Our guest is good. I'm good. All right. So that was the actual energy portion. We might do a little bit more at the end. but That's uh, it? That's all you got? That's all we got for right now, because we have a lot to talk about in a very short amount of time. Okay, that, that, that part's true. We do. I took way too many notes. This is a complex movie. All right. Well, let's get into it. Do, 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 do. Hey everyone, it's Daniel and Robert, the Last Nighters, which is on the Launchpad Media, where they're always launching new ideas in your direction. So do check that out at thelaunchpadmedia.com. And tonight we're going to be talking about V for Vendetta. This is episode 44 of the show, and you can find the show notes and more at lastnighter.com slash 44. We also have a special guest, and uh, we will introduce him in a moment. But let's say hello to Robert, and then we'll get into the guest, and then into the Google description, and then into the show. What's up, so you sexy peoples? Thanks for tuning in for another episode of The Last Nighters. we got a special one for you. Check it out. Yes, we're very excited to have along the ride uh, with us is Jay of Anarcho Coffee, and uh, he is slinging beans for you all. And you can find his beans, roasted beans, at anarchocoffee.com. Take it away, Jay. Hey, guys. What's up? Uh, my name is Jay um, from anarchocoffee.com. Uh, uh, we uh, make self caffeine caffeine uh, for libertarians, agorists, voluntarists, and caps, and uh, really anybody who enjoys a mean fresh brew of coffee. All right. And you reached out to me on the Twitter because we have on there a little note that says, hey, if you're interested in being a guest, hit us up. And you did. So I appreciate that. Um, and then during our uh, back and forth, you actually brought up this movie as one that you were potentially interested in without knowing that it was, in fact, the next movie we were going to talk about. So I'm really excited because this is one that you wanted to do and just so happens that we were ready to do it. So here we are. Let's get into it. We usually start with the Google description. And here it is. V for Vendetta came out 2005. Mystery thriller, two hours and 13 minutes, 8.2 on the IMDb, 73% Rotten Tomatoes, 62% Metacritic, yet 93% of Google users liked it. The description is, following World War, London is a police state occupied by a fascist government and a vigilante known as V, played by Hugo Weaving, uses terrorist tactics to fight the oppressors of the world in which he now lives. When V saves a young woman named Evie, played by Natalie Portman, from the secret police, he discovers an ally in his fight against England's oppressors. Came out March 17, 2006. James McTeague is the director. I'm not sure if I'm saying the name right. 
but the screenplay is by the Wachowskis, who are of the Matrix fame. So, um, Robert, let's get your take on yes, this. Yes, sir. Google description, and then we will pass it over to Jay. Pass that Java over to Jay. Well, that was all fairly correct. Um, I think the Wachowskis now identify as other genders these days, but this is back in the time when they were their original genders, like OG gender. And, and but, you know what? I think in the credits, it says the Wachowski brothers. Yeah, like, I believe so. Yeah. So it's bizarre, but okay. But this is um, this is a comic book movie, for those of you who don't know. This is uh, cool. adapted from a work by Alan Moore, who famously hates all his comic book adaptations. And so his name does not appear in the credits. It's actually just, it says, based on a comic book drawn by, and then it just gives you the artist. But Alan Moore is a um, kind of a famous socialist type guy, but he's also a, he's like a recluse, kind of a, just an angry old man style dude too. But um, yeah, I don't know how we actually thought about this movie, but it seems like, I mean, if he was an angry socialist, like a lot of Antifa's are, you think they might, I don't know, appreciate this kind of a movie? Because it seems like they're battling against a fascist government. They would have all kinds of things to be upset about. And they put on masks and they go around and attack things. They don't smash up Starbucks's. V is actually a little more refined than that. It's, he has a specific set of people who have wronged him and he is seeking justice against those people. But then he's also seeking to blow up a building. And that sounds like something Antifa would be interested in. I don't know. Jay, what do you think about that? Yeah, um, I actually watched the movie uh, twice before we <laughs> before the show. And um, the one thing that kept stick, sticking with me was the non-aggression principle, I guess. Uh, you know, uh, being an ANCAP. And um, although, I mean, I love the idea of, 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 of blowing up government. <laughs> um, but um, I just keep going back to kind of the, the peace tolerance and, and non-aggression principle. Um, and I think there are ways to, um, you know, separate from the government uh, other than, than through violence. Although sometimes uh, violence is, is a necessity. Yeah, it seems like V has this idea that blowing up parliament will incite this greater movement to begin that will essentially be a revolution. It seems to me that he's trying to incite a revolution as opposed to some sort of uh, like movement away from government, just, you know, leaving. Like I would advocate you don't want to be a part of something. You don't want to be around these violent thugs. You disagree with what they do. You would just withdraw. And you would withdraw your support and you would leave and you'd be like, hey, everybody, you don't need to be a part of this. This is all horrific. You don't need to just stop supporting them. Stop sending in tax money, you know, that kind of thing. But instead, he wants to blow up this parliament building, which since the entire movie, everybody seems everybody in the movie seems to understand that the government loves the fear. They love the idea of there being a terrorist and they are like, you know, we're going to protect you from the terrorists. We're going to protect you from the threats. Right. And, the go and then the people go, yes, please, government, protect us from all the threats. We need you. You're our only stop against chaos. You're the best. Keep it up no matter what you got to do. Sweet. I don't know if blowing up a parliament building, it sure seems like a terrorist act that, you know, yeah. They could go, look at this, violence by these terrorists blowing up tarlet buildings. I mean, maybe when everybody is supporting the blowing up of the... I, I don't know. It's kind of a confused message to me. Daniel, do you have uh, some thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, it seems like blowing it up would just play right into their hands. I mean, they've already demonstrated their capacity for instilling fear into people. Um, and it's later revealed that they've perpetrated a lot of false flags that have been catalyzing events in order to... Uh, like implement more of their police state measures like curfews and and a lot of controls um, that, that they are putting in place. And V points out to them during his address that they asked for these things. It's very similar to Fahrenheit 451, where the the people demanded to be protected from ideas. And so the, uh, you know, the uh, literature and, and all the arts and media and, and all of those things were very restricted. And that was kind of happening here as well, where they were um, taking away artwork and the Quran and and anything that had, um, you know, any anything that would elicit imagination or ideas like they had to have these people conform to this and be these like little safe sheep shepherded by these very violent people. Um, and I guess 
I don't see how blowing up the building is going to be that liberating event um, when it's just going to give the government more incentive and more play to say, hey, look, now we're under threat. Now we need to implement even more draconian stuff. And and you will probably agree with us. Right. Though, to your point, you had said that it seemed like a lot of the um, the people watching the, the media uh, were often calling it out like, oh, this is horseshit. Like right. they didn't believe the media. And I don't know, my viewing of this, and, and I was also seeing recent comments like on Amazon, like, oh, I just watched this and it's so much more relevant today with Trump in, in office. Uh, that was a talking point that we were going to get to because I, yeah, they seemed like there's some parallels that some, I was wondering if some Antifa types could draw some parallels there, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I can totally see a very leftist interpretation of this and it probably was left in its or or origin, like you were saying, Alan Moore is a socialist and Right. Although it was written back in the 80s and Margaret Thatcher was the main target back then. But OK. All right. Well, that sort of lines up because she was viewed as very uh, the Iron Lady, right? Like very right. right wing totalitarian, almost totalitarian light. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think that people viewing this now are are thinking that, oh, this is like exactly what we need to do. We need to resist Trump violently if need be. Like this is almost giving the OK to go out and, and punch people. Right. It's kind of a training manual for Antifa. I don't know. Although I think V does actually have, you know, legitimate complaints. Like, I don't know if I would support him in his, you know, basically murdering people. But I mean, what do you guys think about that? He was what, in, you know, imprisoned. And then did medical testing on him. And then, you know, he fought back and eventually burned the place down. And then, you know, comes back and it gets justice on these main characters throughout the movie. So it's Deadpool. <laughs> yeah. So what did you feel? Did you ever feel he was aggressing against any of those people? Or did you feel that he was, you know, fully just acting within justice? Uh, Jay, you want to field that one? Because you, you had some yeah. of the NAP questions at the yeah. beginning there. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely, uh, a toy cost, toy cost, uh, for me because, um, you know, I, I think he was within full reins of justice because of the, you know, imprisonment and torture uh, of him as a human being. Um, um, but at the same time, you know, um, did he have go as far as doing not so, not necessarily torture, but, um, you know, basically murdering, murdering the guys that tortured him and imprisoned him. Um, you know, this eye for an eye thing, um, you know, I'm a big believer in that. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I think, um, uh, but I don't know if he had to blow up parliament, you know, um, did he have to go that far? Because then, then to your point, it's, uh, an act of terrorism and it goes against, you know, um, you know, this idea of non-aggression. Yeah, I, I, I guess, I, you know, V kind of stands, he's been used by various people. I, I first, I think, ran into him when I was, you know, kind of listening to Alex Jones and he would talk about ideas are bulletproof and really rage, you know, really talk up V for Vendetta as this kind of inspirational movie for him. Mm -hmm. And, but Alex Jones is very much a statist. He's like a kind of libertarian, yeah. paleo conservative kind of like guy. And just reset. Oh, it's, yeah, he's a reset. He's Mr. Reset. 1776. The answer to 1984 is 1776 is his famous slogan. And I would also tend to agree that V is not the anarchist symbol that I think maybe Antifa would want. I think he is more of a statist. I don't think he's really, you know, inspiring people to walk away from tyranny. He's like, well, you know, you're just doing it wrong. You're you're doing government wrong. So I, I would say he's a revolutionary and inside the heart of every revolutionary is a bureaucrat waiting to get out. So <laughs> just waiting for their turn at the controls to just do it better than the guy beforehand. So I, I see him. Yeah. I, I'm with him on the justice part, but I do not endorse his, you know, revolution and let's do the government right this time. Rah. Right. His, his famous line in this is that the government should be afraid of the people, not the other way around. Yes. And yeah, it's just basically saying, oh, you're doing government wrong. We need a revolution to have a government of the people that's more responsive to the people. And I think that this ties up uh, to a lot of um, statists who think they're resisting Trump, um, that they think they want. They think that they want more democratic control over our politicians when they don't seem to realize or make the connection that 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 thread is so tenuous and so thin, like you're voting one way or the other really doesn't matter. They don't really care. Um, one and, and they lie for a living, right? To get you to vote for them. 
um, they always go back on their promises anyway. And so I think I think Robert, you're right that he just wants to institute his own uh, form of government or a, a revolutionary government. This seems very French revolution to me, uh, where they just want to throw out the, the bad government and put in their good government, which uh, instantly turns the shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a whole yeah. bunch more people it becomes even worse. Um, but I wanted to ask you, uh, and I'll start with Robert. Um, Regarding his uh, redistributive justice, like his his retribution against the people who had wronged him, um, I was okay with a lot of them because they were still doing bad shit, a lot of these people. But the female doctor who had good intentions and inadvertently, you know, mm. went along with this stuff. And then, um, you know, he actually talked with her and was like, you know, she was apologizing, but he had already poisoned her. Uh, that one got that one got to me a little bit because I was like, well, she had good intentions, didn't mean to do you harm. She was part of this apparatus and she happened to do harm. But it's not like she had ill will in her heart, no malice, no intent to do harm. So I was a little bit torn on that one. What do you what do you think of that? Well, I really liked V's line in that scene. And I wrote it down because, yeah, she wasn't going to continue on to do more things. You're right. And she was probably done with all that and she had moved on to a different phase of her life. But that doesn't absolve her for what her, she did. And also, his line is, I haven't come for what you hoped to do, only for what you did. Mm. So I don't care what your intentions were. I don't care if you intended to cure cancer. You tortured and killed a whole bunch of people. I mean, I'm sure Hitler had great intentions to create a thousand year Reich and uh, make a wonderful fatherland that everybody could be happy in. But that he achieved it by killing a whole lot of people. Same with Mao and Stalin. It, these great societies are always built on the corpses of piles and piles of millions of people. So I don't care what your intentions are. It really matters what your methods are and what you do. So yeah, mm -hmm. I understand that she wasn't a threat to anybody anymore. But I mean, what's the, uh, you know, what's what's the cutoff date on justice? The uh, statute of limitations? Yeah, I don't what's, know. What's your statute of limitations on justice, Daniel? <laughs> well, apparently it's 37 years and you need 1, 000, 1 in 1,024th level of evidence to do a callback to one of our yeah. previous shows. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, the thing I was, I was curious about was um, it seemed like, V initially when he defended uh, Natalie Portman from the fingermen, she was willing to defend herself. And then they say, they say to her, oh, we're fingermen, you know, we're cops, basically. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't I didn't know. But I mean, she was still totally within her rights to defend herself just because they happen to be part of the Gestapo. Uh, you know, doesn't mean that she shouldn't be able to defend herself. But uh, yes, yeah, she starts bootlicking immediately as soon as she finds out that they're government people. Right, right. But even when V comes in to save the day, I don't think he kills those guys. I think he just um, incapacitates them, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. He only knocks them out. And those ones I would have been fine with because, I mean, they were going to kill her. They were going to rape her and then kill her. And they made a weird, um, like, pedophile type reference. They're like, um, what do they say to her? Like, I don't oh, remember. Sorry. I forget. But there were, remember? there were a couple of references in this movie. One was in that scene, and then the other was with the priest. Yes. Yeah. That the one, yeah, both of those references were very creepy. <laughs> yeah, and then there was like another thing in here that was kind of weird. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was. Well, 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 it'll come to me at some point. But um, back to people thinking of this um, as present day and and resisting Trump and all of that. But in this movie, the government had the media in their back pocket, and that's how it kind of used to be here, especially uh, you know during the Obama years and whatnot. Um, mm. They were just total lapdogs for whatever he wanted to do. Uh, but now they are also resisting Trump, but they're doing it all for kind of BS reasons instead of legitimate reasons. And I wonder if that's because all the legitimate stuff would expose them for all the stuff that they gave Obama a pass for previously. So their only option remaining is to pick up on him making fun of people or being mean. And and they have to go after him on those things because they're the only things left that uh, won't expose them for the hypocrites that they are. Not that anyone would really notice, but uh, does well, that they, kind of make they, sense? That mostly makes sense, although they did go after him for the migrant stuff, which had been continuing under Obama for, you know, and be long before that. But I, I agree with you that he's just continuing the wars that the media was completely silent about all through Obama's turn. Yeah. Right. And then a lot of the migrant stuff was happening under Obama and Obama was doing more um, more stuff against it than Trump's even alluded to doing. And then more deportations. The media, yeah. And then and then the media. The deporter in chief. Right. And so it just seems like really bizarre, like that left cover really allows you to get away with even worse stuff. 
It sure does. Yeah. Note to all tyrants. Yeah. It, it, the other thing that I couldn't think of too, when you when you're talking about uh, the comparison of this film and the left, is the anonymous movement, right? So we had the whole anonymous movement back in what was it, oh eight, oh nine, during the recession. Right. And was that were they related to the Occupy Wall Street stuff, or was that kind of separate? It was. Yeah. No. If I remember correctly, like the anonymous movement was related to the Occupy Wall Street, and a lot of those guys wore the Guy Fox Max. Um, so um, it definitely has this kind of tip of the hat to left winging ideology a little bit, um, which is unfortunate because uh, you know I think I see the Guy Fox Max as um, more of an anarchist. Uh, than I do as this left-winging, you know, liberal. Yeah, I would agree with that. Although I, I, it seems like most groups who see him as a like a revolutionary or a resistor, mm. they want to latch on to that. Like, I don't think most people who you know wear a Che Guevara T-shirt understand the horrific things <laughs> that he did. Uh, yeah, that was the other the other one I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you were talking about the you know revolu- you know, because everybody thought she was a revolutionist, but the horrible things that he did to get into power and create his uh, uh, dream of what a government should be. Yeah. Always ends in a lot of dead bodies. Always does. Right. Oh, and I remember the reference that the, uh, the finger lickers um, fingermen gave to uh, Natalie Portman. Finger licker, I like finger lickers better. <laughs> <laughs> they said, uh, spare the rod, spoil the child when they were about to uh, rape her. So, oh, that's disgusting. And right. the guy, the, the character who was playing the guys that were raping her, it was so disgusting. <laughs> yeah, and the, uh, the priest later on. Yeah, super creepy. Yeah, very creepy. Yeah, so I wanted to ask, um, and I'll go to you, Jay, on this one. When V escapes from the, uh, the television studio after playing his message of hate, broadcasting the mm-hmm. message of hate, which is what they all label it as, even though it seemed very tame to me, the message that he sent out, very reasonable, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> but you, know, you, you say something like, um, it's okay to be white, and that's labeled as hate speech now. So who knows, right? But, um, yeah. and, and feel free to you know, jump back onto this portion of this question. But the main question I wanted to ask is, after he saves her uh, from from uh, the broadcast studio and takes her to his house. He says to her, I need to keep you here for a year. And is that like a, um, you know, an imprisonment that's, that's okay. Or is he violating her rights in some way? Like, because if she goes out back into the world, she's going to probably get killed. Right. So he's trying to protect her, but also protect his mission. So feel free to jump on any of that. Yeah. So uh, definitely violating her rights. I mean, nobody should have, uh, any right to withhold anybody for any reasoning. Um, So there's that. And um, yeah, I mean, she, I think the option there should have been, you know, uh, maybe you may go, but sign this agreement that, you know, you can't talk about my revolution or something. Um, um, But yeah. And then uh, your comment about, yeah, the whole white privilege thing, uh, very, um, you know, I've worked in some places where, if you said that, you know, um, <laughs> you were uh, labeled racist or you don't understand what white privilege means. And um, I can only think about my own experiences, which is uh, nobody ever gave me anything. And I had to work for everything that I have today. <laughs> so um, I, I don't know where you think the white privilege thing comes in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and the, the message was um, apparently at some campuses, a simple... Um, piece of paper that says it's okay to be white had been yeah. posted up like on telephone poles and whatnot. And okay. that's being labeled as white supremacist hate speech. That, that's crazy. Yeah. That's currently going down in Australia, although it was doing this, that, that was making the rounds in like universities uh, like last fall. But yeah, but I guess my point is, and Robert, you can jump from this. Maybe I will. Uh, <laughs> that, you know, people looking at this movie as present day, yes. they're probably missing that connection where, um, you know, in the movie, they label V's message as hate speech, as, as, as a message of hate. But mm. these very same people who identify with this movie as resisting Trump and, you know, are rah, 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 are the very same people who are looking at messages that are like, it's okay to be white and labeling those as hate speech, labeling any conservative thought as Nazis as white supremacists, as dog whistlers. So it's it's really bizarre, right? Because in, yeah. in that aspect of this movie, they are the perpetrators of what's represented here. Right, and this is the anti-fascists acting like 
fascists. This is the people who are quick to point out other people having differing views as hate speech. So yeah, how would they react to this movie? Would they see it as problematic that the that the government is is labeling V's speech as hate speech? Because that's what they call everything else. So I don't know. I don't know. I think they take the some good with some bad, probably they think of this movie. Um I do want to talk a little bit about, you know, later on after V imprisons Evie, then she he rescues her from the cops when they break into the TV show guy's apartment. Gordon. She, Gordon, yeah. Then he subjects her to all kinds of torture to, you know, break her of what? What is it? What was it? What he wanted to do? Break her of, you know, not caring anymore, like just going beyond not having anything else to lose. Right? Yeah, where she's willing to die. She right. And that's, enough, yeah. And, and that's another case of I don't care about your intentions. You got me on your side. Good job. You tortured me. I don't know. I, I It makes sense inside the movie, but I think V is acting absolutely in the wrong here. Right. And this ties into his his idea where violence can be used for good. And he says justice. And I think that in a very narrow aspect, yes, that's true. But I'm thinking more in uh, self-defense or uh, in righting a wrong mm. versus how he's using it. And he's using it more in the um, social justice aspect of it. And I think that's and kind the- of... And the, you know, the means justify the end or the ends justify the means. Sorry. So right. he's justifying his in the terror, you know, torture scenario for his greater good society that he wants to build. He's doing the same thing that the government people do. Right. And I think that's kind of a dangerous message for somebody who's going to identify with this movie. And I, I don't want to mean like, you know, it should be like censored or anything like that. But what I mean is someone might watch this who thinks they're a resistor and you know, never Trump or whatever and see violence being advocated for when it's used for good, when it's used for justice. And they think they are doing justice. They think they are doing good by fighting fascists and fighting hate, but they're employing the tactics of hate and fascism in order to do it. And- right, which is why they call hate speech aggression. So then they're justified in violently attacking you and calling it self-defense. Right, because they think they're being just. Right. And, and it's, it's a confusion. I mean, they're, they're perverting so many words and getting themselves into a pretzel to even get into this position to where yeah. words are now, now violence. Uh, but I think they feel totally justified in their actions as a result of this. Yeah, and when, and when she's locked up or when, when V's got EV locked up, I, I just kind of feel like he's it's almost like this brainwashing or propaganda to get her to get on his side to view the way he views the world. Right. Which again, is this whole aggression, right. Or this violent act, believe the way I believe or, or else this is going to happen to you. Yeah. And, uh, man, I, I, I still like the movie a lot. Yes, I do. I I think it's a, cool important type of work but I, i'm glad we're having this discussion about it and could only have that discussion if it exists so i'm glad it got made but it's definitely got lots of issues in terms of kind of a pure philosophy type thing because he i mean when you fight monsters you be careful not to become a monster yourself and there's even a line in the movie that you know you've become a monster because i fought monsters and they made me a monster and but then it, the movie kind of ends as a justification of his philosophy? I don't know. Do you, do you think that the movie's claim that it's making is that V's world is going to be better than the previous, no matter how it's built? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it, maybe we need a V for Vendetta too <laughs> to see how that plays out. Yeah, and just have it be another cycle, just a reset. A reset. And you can't solve a problem with the same mentality that caused the problem in the first place. And it just seems to be that they're using the same mentality as the government people. So, well, going back to what you were saying, right? I mean, it's, it's this idea of like uh, bodies on top of bodies, right. To create this, this, uh, this uh, governing body and which uh, thinking as a anarcho capitalist, why do we even need government? Why can't we just, why can't there, it just be, you know? Right. Yeah. V, V wants, he doesn't want no government. He wants a just government. And if I could take him by the shoulders and shake him, I'd tell him that never in the history of mankind has there ever been such a thing. Yeah. He's like, it's a just government. Yeah. He's like an anti-authoritarian whilst advocating for his own dictatorship. 
so it's it's kind of bizarre yeah um but i wanted to uh bring up um evie's parents because the inspectors who are like trying to track her down when they start talking about the things that happened to her family they start thinking oh this is like she's even more dangerous because her parents were like uh, activists or something like that and they were taken from her when she was 12 uh but they had a line um, in their flashback where they said that um, if they left the country, then the government wins because they're not there to resist or there to fight that government. And I don't know about you guys, but like if things do start getting like bad enough, I'm out. Like I don't need to stick around um, to. You're not going to be the captain of the ship going down with it. Right. I mean, imagine being in, in Germany and, you know, being Jewish in Germany in 1932. Right. And you're seeing the writing on the wall. Yeah. And what did what did the people who stuck around get? Right. Free, free gas. Right. <laughs> uh, that's right. a terrible joke. Um, but that's well, not even a joke. But I mean, they, they got gassed. Right. They got murdered. Um, so, I mean, I, you see that freight train coming down the, the pike. Are you going to just stand there in, in the middle of the tracks or are you going to get out of the way? Yeah. I mean, if I had the means, I'd get out because, you know, these we've mentioned this in previous episodes. But when a government gets tyrannical like this. They one of the first things they do is they control the weapons and they control movement and only approved people or people with the connections and the money can get out. But, yeah, they they really restrict those sorts of things because, you know, restricting freedom is really bad on the economy. So, yeah, it's, it's not good unless you can keep everybody still in there because, yeah, people will people tend to move towards freedom. They move towards economic opportunity. Throughout human history, they've always gone to new areas, new lands to settle, go where there is opportunity. There's a reason why people make milk carton rafts to get to the United States, not from the United States, to get to the magical worlds of Venezuela and Cuba. Well, not not yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so back to the, the bishop guy. He was uh, under surveillance and the cops were the fingermen were listening to his encounter with Evie dressed up as like a young prostitute. Right. Yep. So they were totally aware that this was going on and had been going on with probably younger kids uh, yep. previously. And yet they were totally cool with it. Right. Like they were. I don't even know why he was under surveillance. He was one of the, the kingpins in the in the party. Right. Right. Was it just a matter of everyone's under surveillance at all times? I think that's what it was. It was like a mix yeah. of 1984. Yeah, everyone's under surveillance all the time. But since you're a member of the party or a high-ranking member of the party, you get to do whatever you want, essentially. Oh, you get a and pass. That's, which, that's accurate for the most part. Yeah, I mean, I mean, let's, I mean, let's not talk about another movie, but the, you know, the movie Spotlight and and the Boston Journal exposing all of the, um, you know, Catholic priests and how they move them around to you know, hide the fact that there was, you know, um, this child molestation going on, right? So, you know, the higher power, the more power you have, the more stuff you get away with, right? Um, and a quote from one of my favorite books, right? Uh, Prince, um, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah, and these organizations there will protect their own and allow that sort of behavior to continue all the time. And you'll see it within the Catholic Church, these old institutions, and you'll see it in these massively... I mean, how many people did Bill Clinton rape? I don't know. Uh, no. High-ranking party members get to do essentially whatever they want, kill whoever yeah. they want, and say that they're, oh, they're an enemy of the party. Oh, they're an enemy of the state. Yeah. And uh, who's going to stop them? Everybody underneath them is terrified of them because they're willing to use violence at the drop of a hat. I mean, uncles, you know, Joe Stalin like threatened his own family and like threw like sent a bunch of them to the gulag. So even they weren't, you know, immune from like, you know, speaking their mind or being able to speak their mind around the guy. Right. And that reminds me of that Gordon character who made fun of the uh, the party leader. I forget his name. Uh, was he a chancellor? Was that who he was? Yeah, I forget his name. But yeah, something chancellor uh yeah and he was yep that's right he he was kind of like this late night show jimmy fallon guy who uh, made fun of the leader and uh <laughs> very next day gets his door kicked in uh by the very government he was making fun of and who knows where he got sent off and what happened to him but i can only imagine yeah v said that they uh they killed him because they found the quran that he had yeah so had yeah, they yeah. found that it would have just been imprisonment no, maybe not, right? Because he was also a homosexual. So uh, they also were against uh, any other 
religions uh, and and homosexuality as well. Right, and I could see people likening this, you know, to present day as that being a, a, an anti-Trump thing. Though, as far as I know, he hasn't done anything that's anti-gay, has he? He's actually the very first president ever to run on a gay marriage being legal platform. Obama in his first term was not for it. Right. And Hillary wasn't back then either. Hillary wasn't. No. I mean, as soon as public opinion topped over 51%, then all of a sudden the politicians totally believed in it 100%. But before that, they were totally against it. It was man and a woman, and that's the way God wants it, and blah, blah, blah. Right. And that was back when uh, this movie was made, right? Uh, when Obama and, and Hillary were, were making comments like that. And, yeah, this is what, 07? Uh, 06, yeah. So I think Obama was just a little bit after that in, in the public eye, really. But uh, this this kind of ties back to that long running like cultural commentary that you and I have talked about many times on the show in the past, where they introduce ideas in entertainment first, and then it it kind of gets um, people get acclimated to that idea, and then it gets introduced in like uh, politics, and then it becomes mainstream acceptable. And there's an example of that in this movie with the um, with Gordon being a gay character, but also the note that evie reads it's from a girl who uh, grew up liking another girl and then that relationship broke up and and that school girlfriend went back and you know married a man but then the uh, original girl who was imprisoned here got into other lesbian relationships and then the government because she was a homosexual uh separated her and captured her put her in this prison and i'm just wondering if that was like at the time that this movie was made, and I don't know if this was part of the comic or not from back in the 80s, but if that was a if that was intentionally in there to help promote that in a cultural way, if you follow what I'm saying, like I believe I, I also don't know if it's in the original comic book or not. I would guess not. I guess I would guess that that was a, an issue very much of the time. And yeah, as a way to promote that through the culture, that's my guess is that the, the writer of the screenplay, the Wachowskis were very much like, hey, let's introduce this. This is kind of of the time. This is a pressing issue that we care about. Let's do this right now and add this in. And this kind of makes sense. And we'll make them we'll make the horrific fascist government also anti-gay. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, wait, the being what? gay part, <laughs> not, not the fascist government going after them. You're pro fascist government now, Daniel. I knew it. You son of a bitch. You got me. You know, it's funny. You get into these debates with people and um, you talk to them about the free market and they think that you're a fascist because of that. And I, no, I'm like talking about voluntary consensual interactions with people. And that's somehow fascism now. It's so I don't know crazy. what you just said. All I heard was a bunch of misogynistic, homo homophobic crap. So. Bunch of hate speech. Bunch oh, of hate speech. speech. Yeah. All right. Uh, Robert, you said you had a bunch of notes. So why don't you uh, hit your next big one and then we'll start to uh, close out the show. We're, we're getting close to uh, the end point of the last nighter show. Well, one thing that stuck out to me, and this isn't the biggest of deals, but I thought it was strange when in the very beginning, V blows up the old Bailey. And I thought, and because it had been a while since I've watched the movie and I don't remember, I didn't remember exactly what happened, that the government would immediately out you know, some terrorist as being the culprit and that everybody should be afraid and give them more power because that's, and then the theme, that's the theme of the movie. But in the beginning, the government's like, oh no, we are going to blow up the old Bailey anyway. And someone just beat us to it. And we don't know what the fireworks are all about. That was kind of like weird. So it seemed like an opportunity for the government to, you know, really jump on the, the old fear train and play it up for more power. But it didn't, happen that way and i it just stuck out because the rest of the movie is consistently about that everything else v does it's like oh my god the big terrorist v he's the worst thing ever and you need to be afraid of him yeah it's like he's giving them the villain they need on a silver platter like government always needs some something to make the people afraid of right no matter what it is it's got to be something you have to be afraid and they are the solution to it right yeah so like once russia was you know once the ussr dissolved then it was like what the war on drugs or, or saddam hussein or something right then it was middle easterners yeah so yeah it's crazy yeah what do you think jay yeah um i well uh, there's a lot to digest there but um I, I keep thinking about um, actually when and towards the beginning of the movie, when the act happened of blowing up um, the, the, the first building there, they uh, the chancellor would ask, 
uh, what do you guys hear on the rate? You know, what do you hear? What is the people? What are the people thinking? Right. So the the act of spying and what are they at? You know, um, and they there's this chatter of of this you know revolutionary character V and and the chancellor's like we have to put it into this right now, right? And so more propaganda on on the mainstream media outlets, right? In the movie. Um, yeah, that was so, another thing that I thought was weird was that they announced that he was dead at one point. Yeah, yeah. It's like, why would you want to do that? That just ends the story. That just ends everything. And then you look like a fool later when he turns up alive. So you want to keep the fear going, make him build him up into this big boogeyman. Well, maybe they were afraid that his message was getting out because like he, he made the point, and maybe that's what the movie was trying to follow, was that the buildings that he's destroying are built and they say something. They are a symbol of something. And so is their destruction. Well, and, remember, oh, sorry, I'm not going to go off what you're saying. I'm going to continue my thought because I'm okay. a terrible, selfish piece of shit. <laughs> but remember, remember with Osama bin Laden and he was the big bad boogeyman. And, you know, he he never had like a message to the people of the United States. We like we never really got to know what his griefs or what he was upset about. All we got were he's evil. He hates your freedom and he wants to kill you. And we're going to go get them and we need to fight this war in Afghanistan and blah, 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 and everywhere else in the world. And what was my fucking point? God damn it. Were you saying that 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 was what was presented in the media? Because I thought that he did have some actual legit messages that said what his grievances were. Um, It just wasn't uh, widely distributed, that information. Right. So, God damn it. This is like a half formed thought in my brain. So I'm kind of just free association thinking. (laughs) But. So, yeah, the U.S. media would never really d- deep dive into what the gripes were of Osama bin Laden were. They would just be like, bad brown man, need to fight. So they would just, you know, whatever his message actually was didn't matter. They would just use him and then craft a new narrative, their own narrative that suited them better, which is what politicians always do, regardless yeah. of, you know, what question you ask of them, they'll just answer the question they want to answer. So why didn't the government, I understand this is a movie, but why didn't the government just switch his message around? Fuck it. Let's stop talking about this. I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> let's no, I want to jump off. What you you want to jump about? off it? Jump off it, Daniel. Make no, some sense I, out of what that bullshit I was saying. No, I actually, I, I see uh, I see some parallels here with, with the movie and with your Osama bin Laden point. Uh, because if they said what Obama or Osama actually said, then it would implicate the United States and the military and all the actions that the media has to cover for, right? All the actions that... um, They all support, right? Right, that they all support and that, um, you know, the blowback is real, like Ron Paul talks about. Um, So they have to change the message to brown man bad or, or middle eastern man bad similarly and and this is this ties together with my theory at the beginning where they attack trump the media attacks trump on orange man bad orange man did bad things not on anything he does that's bad that any president would do right they can't they can't go after that because that implicates them and their their deity of government excellent job tying it all around i like the way you wrap nice. that all together daniel that was well done you took my shit show of a message and turned it into a beautiful swan at the end. Good job. Well, that's what we do here at The Last Nighters. We take a shit show and turn it into a decent show. In theory, anyway. Yeah, on paper. All right. So any last notes or comments before we get into final summaries and reviews here? I'm looking through my notes. The rest I have, I mean, we talked about most of this stuff. I mean, do you guys want to talk about the uh, V stealing the artwork and stuff from the censors? And he's like, well, theft implies ownership. Oh, that was kind of a cute line. No, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah, they were not the rightful possessors of that of that property of those items. So uh, he was liberating them. He was relieving them from their unjust uh, possessors. Now he probably would have been more difficult, but it would have been better if he had actually tried to get those pieces of property back to their legitimate owners. But yeah, I can see why that would be difficult under the world that he lived in. Right, but this might be a case of right for the wrong reasons because I could see leftists who identify with this movie saying oh yeah this uh, all this... properties unjustly held right yeah exactly <laughs> right so it's like a justification for them for them to do that right right no that's that that could be very true that's why yeah maybe ancoms really like this movie a lot i don't know yeah it seems to be um what do you what do you guys think of the final um confrontation with the number two you know lieutenant guy who actually killed the the chancellor and then tried to kill v and there's like a dozen guys all shooting at him and 
he says that he'll, um, you know, if he's still standing, he'll kill them all with just his knives. Because uh, I thought that was kind of corny. I mean, it looked cool, like with the knives whipping around and they would show the like the little, I don't know, the contrail kind of thing, like with it spinning around. Um, and it's actually related to they couldn't reload their semi-autos fast enough before he could reach them um, and kill them with knives. And that's actually a legitimate thing. Like It's called the Tuller drill. And they measure how far away someone, a knife, wielding attacker would need to be uh, from you to be able to draw and fire your weapon to defend yourself. And it's, I think, roughly 30 feet. And um, my uh, firearms instructor, Masada Ayub, I went to a week-long training with him and he said, um, you know, with, with a firearm, you have a limited number of ammunition and you have to aim properly. You have to have certain technique, certain speed. But if you have someone who has a knife, they have unlimited ammunition they can cover distance. They can do, you know, multiple uh, stabbings like very quickly. And, uh, you know, if you compare like a, a firearm to a knife, the knife can be far more deadly. Uh, but then, you know, whenever it's brought up in like, say, a court case, the gun is always like the most evil thing ever, even though a knife can be far more deadly. I would tend to agree, although I would say that the knife requires a higher, there's a higher skill required to be that deadly. Whereas the gun, which is called the, you know, the great equalizer, is a uh, lower lower skill although the, not to say that the, there isn't a lot of skill required to operate a, a handgun also right and v was very very highly skilled with those knives yeah and he also had some kind of what they talked about his enhanced kinetics they said yeah, yeah as a result would, of his experimentation and he was also wearing a vest too uh, some kind of metal vest um, but he also had some yeah enhanced mutation so he could you know take more bullets and that's why he was able to bounce back and use the knives yeah what did you guys think about the acting in this movie? Because I liked Hugo Weaving, but I really didn't like Natalie Portman. I, if you watch it carefully, and I was really getting really my judgmental critic eyeballs on, because I don't know if it was the direction, but there were so many times when she would be asked a question and she would immediately answer and just read her line, like just read your line. That's not how people interact with each other. They, they listen, they consider the question, and then they respond. There's a, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a pause there, but she was just like, I don't know. She seemed very amateurish in this movie. I don't know if anybody else noticed it, but no, I did one, not notice that. One of my gripes. One of my gripes. You know, it might be because you and I talk enough and I have such a long pause before. <laughs> I was the question, it's it true. It's true. Up. It takes like two seconds for him to think before he talks. <laughs> but she was so quick. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I found that, uh, and I'll start summary and review here. Um, the first couple of times I saw this movie back when it came out, I really enjoyed it. And I also remember like being very um, swayed by things like the Zeitgeist movement and Peter Joseph's eloquent psychobabble and even being sympathetic to uh, some of the uh, Occupy Wall Street stuff and the messaging from Anonymous and even Bernie Sanders back when he claimed to be independent. Uh, because I think that they do a fair job of identifying problems and showing you that something's wrong. Usually their prescriptions are quite incorrect but sometimes maybe even accidentally sometimes they even get some of the culprits right right like oh those greedy bankers well yeah i mean the bankers were doing some shady shit granted it, a lot of it was re related to like perverse incentives and, and things of that nature but in my more recent viewing of this which was just last night i found that this movie was just not very good uh it the the acting yeah like you said natalie portman pretty wooden seemed amateurish hugo weaving it was just over the top for me, like the vanquish the villain in the villainous vanquishing where, you know, like his entire monologue was every word was a V. And I know it was supposed to be like that was intentional and it was supposed to seem like um, almost theatrical and, and Shakespearean in a way. And he would quote Shakespeare a couple of times in the movie, but it just seemed over the top to me and, and goofy. And and uh, so and then and then I just got torn up on all the leftist messaging that I see in this thing. So it, it really fell a little bit flat for me. But I think that's more of a result of uh, two things. One is becoming a, an AMCAP um, and having some, you know, principles and grounded beliefs and then seeing these things for what they are and, and what their solutions are and how they're wrong. Uh, and then the other is looking at it with a critical eye where, you know, now we're part of doing this show where we are looking at movies of, like how well is that made? How are they acting? You know, like what are some of the goods and the bads about this thing? And looking at it with a critical eye, I think that uh, it it does ruin a lot of movies for me that previously I had enjoyed, whether they were well done or not. So 
unfortunately, I'm going to go below a five on this thing. I'm going to go with a 4.5. So, Jay, would you like to uh, give us a summary and review with the score? One through ten, uh, a decimal deep. Yeah, uh, I want to keep it short. Um, so um, when I was googling around for you know libertarian movies for for uh, for joining on the show, V for Vendetta was listed as one. And after for tonight, I would say V for Vendetta is far from ANCAP libertarian uh, as it can be. And uh, you know for um, and I do agree with yeah Natalie Portman's. Um, role was kind of a little shoddy in this and um i would say yeah i'm gonna go with a, a 4.9 on the on the scale <laughs> some tough reviewers tonight i like it i like it when you get a little more critical of these films um even though uh you know it's better than any movie i've ever made but you know still that's her, that's her <laughs> job um as Dan was saying, I think leftists do a fairly good job of identifying issues, um, at least as they see it. You know, I don't agree with a lot of their social justice stuff. It just comes down to them whining about other people's preferences and that they're not shared preferences. But they also do identify some problems. I believe uh, Joe Rogan likes to call them white blood cells. And I think that's a pretty apt metaphor where they don't know exactly what the issue is, what the ins and outs and the details, but you know, they go there and they fight the thing that they see is wrong and Occupy Wall Street and Antifa and those kind of things kind of act in that way. And this movie is similar. I think that it identifies some problems and I think that they have legitimate gripes. The world they set up is horrific. If I lived in that world, I don't think I would last very long. I would try and escape. My mouth would probably get me killed almost instantly. Um, but you know, ultimately it's inconsistent. Like we've talked about in this episode, it's, you know, I'm, I'm with him on the justice. I'm against him on the revolution. You're just doing, you're just governmenting wrong. You're just, there's no such thing as a just government. Uh, anybody that initiates aggression on a peaceful people isn't going to be a just organization. It's, it's like, would you say the mob is a just organization? Can you take over the mob and turn it into a good organization? So why do you think you can turn government good? It's uh, you're you're wasting your time. And you're wasting everybody else's time and blood and energy uh, with that with that fantasy fairy tale. So, but I still enjoy the movie. I'm going to give it a more positive score. I, I think it's still a lot of good sentiment in it, even if it gets a lot of things wrong. And uh, it's a great discussion piece. I really enjoyed the talk tonight. So I'm going to give this a 6.2. Super positive compared to my other reviewers tonight. But yeah, I, I still uh, I think it's, it's got more going on for it than it does against it, even though I think that it ultimately gets the uh, the final message wrong. So that's it for me. All right. Well, very good. Well, thank you for that, Robert. And thank you, Jay, for being a guest. And uh, before we sign off, why don't you let the listeners know where they can find your stuff? And uh, then I will close us out. Yeah. Uh, so anarchocoffee.com. Uh, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter uh, at Anarcho Coffee. Um, and uh, yeah, come check us out. Uh, buy some great coffee. All right. Well, I might just do that myself. Coming up next week, we're going to be talking with Mance Raider about Dances oh, with Wolves. That's and, awesome. Uh, that's one of his favorite movies. It's one that he brought up. And so we're yeah. going to get through that epic marathon of a movie. And there's actually an extended cut of it that's four hours long. Um, oh, I might. That's, that's... I might try to watch that. I don't know. Yeah, that's you're probably gonna watch it on two times speed, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see me doing that rain dance like super fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Mance is is great. Uh, I same thing. Kind of reached out to him on Twitter. I was like, hey, I'm doing this. Can I send you a sample of our coffee? Uh, I sent him a sample the other day, and um, you know, hopefully soon he'll be uh, you know just helping out, get the word out. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, hey, thank you guys, everyone, uh, for being a, a, a listener of The Last Nighters. Uh, you can find this on the Launchpad Media, like I was saying. Uh, the show notes and more for this episode can be found at lastnighters.com slash 44. And if you like what we do here, you can support us over at Patreon. We've got various gifts and uh, different goodies available at different price points. And that's at lastnighters.com slash Patreon. Uh, so I think that's uh, going to do it for tonight. So thanks again and good night from last night.
All right, we're going to con- continue the transmission on Actual Anarchy for a few more minutes. Uh, you mentioned, Jay, our guest, you mentioned that you found this on a list of libertarian movies, and that was what brought this up uh, as a movie you wanted to discuss. So let's let's dissect that a little bit in the Actual yeah. Anarchy portion. Um, when you suggested this movie, it was because you saw it on that list, and you, at that time, did you think that, yeah, this is probably a pretty libertarian movie, and then in your viewing, did you still feel that way? until you ran into the buzzsaw of Daniel and Robert of the actual energy podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I, I think, what did we say? I said, yeah, be for a Dender or the Lego movie. Right. It was kind of just one of these, um, you know, one I found on a list of uh, whatever top 10 libertarian movies to watch or something. And no, I, I think actually my um, had a different viewpoint after I had watched, rewatched it uh, since 2007, 2008, just recently, I think watched it Tuesday night. And I said, well, this doesn't really bow to the libertarian principles or uh, anarcho-capital principles, you know, because there's a lot of um, uh, violence, aggression against others. Um, and he's talking about just putting in a different kind of government. So uh, how, how does that, you know, viewed as as libertarian Um so, yeah, your thoughts? Yeah, I wonder, um, and Robert, I, I didn't mean to step on your toes here, but I'm wondering if, if the person who made that list is, um, I don't want to do the libertarian purity test, but if maybe they were less like strict, thin, thin style libertarian, you know, and more big Such tent latest Daniel libertarian types who are just like, well, the movie is anti authoritarian and anti fascist government. And well, to be fair, poor. there aren't That's a true. whole lot of libertarian movies. This it's a very low bar. We don't have a lot of them. We've got like Atlas Shrugged. We've got Magnificent Seven. Probably a few others. Dallas oh, Buyers oh, Club. Um, yeah, Dallas Buyers Club. Uh, um, Billy Madison. The founder. <laughs> the founder. The founder was great, and and we did a good episode on that uh, about a year ago yeah. now. It's one of my favorite episodes, actually. We've got yeah. Mad Max. Oh no, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there aren't a lot of a lot of uh, libertarian movies, so I could see why someone would put this on the list, if nothing more, to have a, a discussion point. But yeah, I think I would expect more of a an ancom to celebrate this movie than a libertarian after a careful inspection. Although, if you're just trying to remember it from the time you first saw it way back in the day, and you really responded positively to it, like I did back in the day, like I yeah. absolutely for it back in the day. Um, yeah, I think there's that's more understandable. Yeah, and and. I think that I had a similar feeling back when I first saw it initially. But like I said uh, during the show uh, or the main uh, the last nighters portion, um, I was compelled by a lot of different things going on at the same time. I felt like very much like I was an independent type and I was taking information from a lot of different sources and trying to synthesize it and process and make sense of what was going on in the world around this time. You know, because 2000, 2008, 2007, 2008 uh, was the, you know, the housing collapse and financial crisis and everyone was looking for answers. Uh, people knew that something was wrong and, and you were getting different stories from different areas and the stories kept changing. Um, this is where I got introduced to Ron Paul, um, but also, you know, Occupy and Bernie Sanders and Anonymous. And and so this kind of stood out as um, whatever's happening right now is wrong and bad. And so therefore, I'm going to listen to these things that are telling me, yeah, these are bad things that are going on. And it's only, you know, 10 years later after really diving into this. And, and what really got me uh, going was um, being introduced to Steph Molyneux back when he was a good ANCAP and also the uh, the Mises Institute. They had a 52 week course in Austrian economics. And I did that as a uh, like individual. Like I just went through it. It was I got through it in one year and it was really good. And I'm actually in the process of doing it again now with a group of people. And we do that on Saturday nights called the Rothbard Roundtable, which is a lot of fun. But um, anyway, I, th- I think that until you have the uh, intellectual meat to put on those bones, then looking at this movie with just kind of the the outline and the superstructure and like the oh i kind of remember this and it seemed to be anti-authoritarian anti-government in some ways um then yeah you can kind of categorize it in in that kind of big camp uh libertarian right uh, because yeah like i i think that one thing that libertarians share with the rest of humanity is the recognition of injustice and the thirst for justice and this movie gets that fairly right i mean think i think you know everybody is on board with v as he's striking back at the people who wronged him and the people that murdered all those people i mean not only did they murder the you know the 25 or 30 people that they threw in that mass grave but then they also 
murdered, you know, like a hundred thousand people in these, these chemical terror attacks and like whatever, what was it? The, uh, the, the disease they unleashed and then they turned around and sold the cure through their pharmaceutical company. Mm, I think a lot of people can recognize how horrifically immoral that is. And you strive for justice and see that as, um, you know, a good positive moral tale, except for the, except for the end and and a few other things. I'm not, not, not on board with. All right. Well, I think that was a a worthy end of the uh, actual anarchy portion of the show. And we can get into some Kathleen Turner overdrive right after this. But before that, um, I did want to bring up a Mises quote in honor of our guest, Jay, from Anarcho Coffee. This is a Mises quote about coffee and about the no. free market. <laughs> so I will end on this note, uh, episode 101 of the show. And this is Mises. To drink coffee, I do not need to own a coffee plantation in Brazil, an ocean steamer, and a coffee roasting plant. Though all these means of production must be used to bring a cup of coffee to my table. Sufficient that others own these means of production and employ them for me. That's Mises talking about how amazing it is that you can get a cup of coffee from halfway around the world on your table every morning through the magic of the market. I love it. It almost brought a tear to my eye, man. Uh, So go ahead and visit us at anarchocoffee.com. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at anarchocoffee. Uh, And for first-time visitors, um, you can use coupon code AA2018 for 10% off your first order. All right. Thank you kindly. That's for our actual Anarchy audience listeners, 10% off at anarchocoffee.com. And coming up next week, we're going to be talking with Mance Raider about Dances with Wolves. So do check that out next week for episode 102 of the Actual Anarchy Show. Well, I'm going to send you this quote so you can uh, use it as you will. And, I will. Uh, uh, I do appreciate you being a guest, and I, I hope that you do stick around for Kathleen Turner Overdrive. That's what's available for our Patreon supporters. And if anyone else wants to get in on that action, uh, go to actualanarchy.com slash Patreon and uh, give us some of your dollars, some of your Federal Reserve notes, and we will exchange with you in a mutually beneficial transaction where you get bonus content that's coming up right after this. Chipmunks. C H I P M U N K. We're the chipmunks. Guaranteed to brighten your day. Do 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 do